Hello and good evening, good afternoon to everyone watching today and also in the future. I'm David Lindo, also known as Jürgen Berner. This is In Conservation With. I'm with Lev Perikian and he um, and I will be talking tonight about lots of different things, but predominantly about his book, Light Rain Sometimes Fall. Love the title, by the way. Um, and just before I start, and before we actually start the conversation, just want to say that tonight is sponsored by Leica Sport Optics and the Deputation de Cathras, which is the tourism board that looks after the northern province of the uh, region of Extremadura in southwest Spain, which is an amazing place when it comes to wildlife and also lots of his history there as well. So uh, that's the, uh, the introductions. Lev? Lovely to see you again. It's been two years nearly. How are you and where are you? I'm well. Thank you so much for having me on again, David. Um, I am I'm well and we're still in the pandemic, but it seems to be a slightly different situation from last time we we spoke. Um, and I am in my home in South London, which is also uh, pretty much in the middle of the the patch in in which the light rains sometimes fall is set. So that kind of gives a nice segue into the um, into the subjects of the book, if you want. But I'm I'm basic basically well, but uh, uh, living one day at a time, which is the best way these days. Yeah, it's interesting. One day at a time. I mean, I met you online. Um, well, actually, it wasn't two years ago exactly, but it must must have been like April oh. or May or whatever last yeah, yeah. twenty twenty. You know, and it's funny. You are one of the group of people that I've met online, and mm. I, I never met in person. Yeah, I'm not dating you or anything. It's just basically met you online. <laughs> that's that, and and we've become sort of online buddies. Um, yeah, right. I, I guess post internet, it would have been we would have been pen pals, wouldn't we? I suppose so. It's a strange, it's a strange relationship. I mean, it's it's interesting that we've got I've got used to uh, making friendships online on social media, um, and it's it's strange, isn't it, how you can actually strike up. Um, proper friendships i think you know if you're if you're doing it right then uh then you can actually make real friends and i've gone on to meet some of the people i know on twitter uh i've met through twitter i've gone on to you know meet them in in real life and and they've become you know proper friends and of course with um with the pandemic we have a new generation of online friendships which is the the zoom community and uh, it feels it's it's a strange in a strange sort of way. This feels like a bit of a nostalgia trip because it's a it, it puts you straight back into those days from the the early those early lockdowns when Zoom was the only option. Um, and of course, now we can you know depending on where you live, you can do quite a bit more nowadays. And certainly in my um, in my day job, which isn't really a day job as a conductor, orchestra conductor, things are kind of inching their way back towards something like normal in that we're having normal-ish rehearsals with people distanced and masked and we are putting on concerts uh which you know two years ago just or eight, you know, whenever it was we were back, back right in the um the heart of it may june uh, 2020 was just not a possibility and we didn't we had no idea when that was going to happen again so uh yeah it's very interesting this sort of hybrid life we're living nowadays <laughs> Do you think that the uh, the whole pandemic has changed you as a person? Ooh, straight in with the deep question. Um, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Possibly, but possibly, maybe I haven't noticed how it's changed me. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I'd like to think that I'm the... Oh, yeah, I don't know. I maybe I'm more thoughtful about other people's experiences i don't know uh i'd like to think i am because i think it, it, we've had uh we've seen a lot of suffering um uh and you know those of us who are still hanging around and we've maybe not been affected it quite so much as others who have had real you know really hor horrendous times and you see that on a daily basis and you think okay well i've been really i've been lucky in my life anyway i'm an incredibly privileged person to the the, the, the life that i've led 
Um, but that, I think it's brought it home quite a lot, I think, in the last couple of years. That, you know, it's still, still going on, still managing to, to get from day to day. So, yeah, maybe. Maybe, maybe it hasn't. Maybe it's made me a worse person. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, for those who may not know who Lev Perikian is, um, as you said previously, you are a conductor, but also a birder and mm -hmm. author of Why Do Birds Suddenly Disappear and Into the Tangled Bank, which I have with me here as well, uh, as well as your latest book, of course. Um, you're in South London, even though in your bio it says West London, so maybe you've yeah, that's something that's uh, that's actually it's something that slightly snuck in because it's the, the particular area of South London that I live in is called West Norwood, and I think there was, at some point there was a copy edit that just got um, conflated the two, so it's West London. I must get on to, to, to change that. <laughs> so in, it depends which version of the biography you see. So you're in South West London then, uh, yeah, just like uh, living with your family and. Uh, who are getting increasingly um, used to your enthusiasm for nature. And uh, you also go on to say that your prize sighting as a birder was a golden oriole in the Apujaras in Spain, which is in Andalusia, yeah? That's right, yeah, this is just near um, Granada. We went to, uh, on a trip back in, it's a, a long, I mean, it feels like ages ago, only, only 2017, but we went to Granada. My wife is a very keen gardener and garden designer. And we went on a trip to see the Alhambra um, and to the area in general. And we took one day out, um, a very hot day, very, you know, a, 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 went, went on what turned out to be quite an ambitious walk with my son, who was then 12. Um, and it was, a yeah, it was quite a long day. And about halfway through it, we turned around the corner and there was this fantastic male golden oriole sitting in the middle of a, in a dead tree. And it just, for, for me, that it took my breath away because, of course, you know, I've mostly done my birding in, in Britain and a, a golden oriole here is, would be really quite the thing. Um, so, and they're just such stunning, stunning birds, like, you know, out of a, out of a um, fairy tale almost. So that, that really, I think it's partly the circumstances um, that, that made it especially memorable, memorable. Have you seen one since? No, still the only one uh, because I haven't actually been out of the UK since. So, <laughs> so, so, so that's my excuse. Oh, okay. It's the most wonder. It's the, it's a, got a fantastic mixture, isn't it? The song of it's kind of conversational. Isn't it? It feels like it's sort of chatting to you, but, it, but it, that great whistling, descending whistling sound as well, which I, which I love. So I'd love to, yeah, I'd love to hear one of those live, one of these days. Get them back breeding in. Can you fix it, David? You're the you're the you're the best best bird guy I know. So well, you can when, I, when I come back to UK, I'll bring some in the box with me. Yeah, bring some in the box. Get them breeding. Get get a release program going in Norfolk. Yeah, somewhere. I might have to pay a lot of the customs though. But anyway. <laughs> But the thing is, I mean, with the Golden Oriole, this song, for me, it just brings up the hairs in the back of my neck because it sounds so tropical. And, you you know, in mm -hmm. this part of Spain, they're quite common during the summer. Yeah. You need to come down here if you want to check them out. But basically, that's that song, when I hear it, I have to stop. Even though I hear it every day, I still have to yeah. stop. It's just an amazing sound. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing you've talked about was the, uh, your Black Red Start in, um, in the... Uh, in Dungeness Power, Sta Power Station, which I've, it's a whole, old stomping ground of mine as well, actually. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a funny one, the Black Red Star. Again, that's another bird that is pretty common in loads of bits of mainland Europe, but it's still quite a sighting in, in the UK, isn't it? I mean, it, they're, they're not rare, rare, but it's still something you need to, to, you want to go and look for or be kind of aware of. Um, and the, the history behind that is mostly that it was, um, when I was a kid, I was a very keen birder and I had the old um, uh, Reader's Digest book of British birds and I did my ticks, you know, again, against the birds on every page. And part of the story of my first book, birding book, but why do birds suddenly disappear is my rediscovery of that childhood passion and going to that old book and looking through it and seeing that I put a tick against Black Red Star. Um, and realising that when I was 11, 12 years old, I was just this big liar 
um, pretending to have seen birds that I hadn't seen because I just I knew I hadn't seen it, but I thought, well, I'll just you know, I'll I'll take it. So so then when I came back to birding in my late forties, early fifties, about you know nearly ten years ago now probably, that was one of the ones that I wanted to see and see honestly. Uh, and so yeah, then um, down at Dungeness one day, uh, you know, as you say, it's a great place great place for birding and just on the by the fence you know the fence by the power station um quite near the obs and uh it just i heard it first and then managed to, to see it so it's just one of those things you know how so, so, so certain things stick in your mind memorable experiences um and then since then the the next encounter i had with the black red star was on piccadilly in london and i'd just come out of um hatchards and was ju just about kind of getting adjusting from uh you know indoor sound to outdoor sound and buses and traffic whizzing by and i heard this you know song you know how your head snaps up when you hear a song that you're not quite expecting you go, what's that uh, then there's silence so you're going did i imagine it but then it went again and I thought, yes, there's a there's a black red star here singing somewhere, and it was on, I think, on the roof, over the road. So it's great to it's great, you know, in the middle of uh, a, a town to to hear something that's just slightly unusual like that. So yeah, I mean, you say not too rare, but actually they are pretty rare. I mean, they're one of Britain's rarest breeding birds. I mean, it's less less at the, at the max. There's less than forty pairs in the whole country breeding. Yeah. And, um, I suppose, so, but, but some of them are in London, so it's yeah. the kind of thing that if you, if you know where they are, you can pretty much, you know, you can go and find one reasonably, you know, if you if you if you get the right time of year and, and all of that, then you'll be you might be able to find one quite easily if you know. But yeah, they, absolutely, it's very small numbers. But what I'm particularly proud of is the fact that the first ever breeding record of black red star in the UK was in my hometown of Wembley. Um, when they were building Wembley Stadium in 1920. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. So that was it. They obviously knew you were going to be coming along a couple of decades later. And, uh, a couple uh, of decades. <laughs> couple of couple of 20 decades. Anyway, a few decades. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so anyway, we're, we're here to talk, you know, around your, your book, Light Rain Sometimes Fall. And um, again, for those who don't, um, or haven't read it or haven't come across it. It's um, a British year through Japan's 72 seasons. Now, the 72 seasons thing, I only found out about last year when I, when I interviewed someone on an In Conservation with um, guest um, who was talking about the weather. And mm. I, it, it talked about the 72 seasons that Japan has. So can you give us the definition of that? Because the seasons are becoming as far as I'm concerned, less distinct, you know, in they the are. past, and I, I'm sure everyone's echoing this, but in the past, they were distinct, you know, it was spring, then it was summer, you know, sunny, hot, then the leaves fell, it was autumn, and then it became winter. And now it's spring, a little bit of summer, maybe a couple of days, and yeah. then maybe it sort of melds into a grey autumn, and then it's November, November, November. November. <laughs> um, so... And we're now on January the 328th, aren't we? I think something like that. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So what? How? How are? Firstly, how are seasons de uh, defined now in your mind? So the in my mind, uh, it's interesting because this has always uh, been something that you know, not always, but it's certainly in the last 15 years, uh, people had always said, "Oh God, August is so terrible." I remember this from the 90s especially people saying oh. and then there was all then there was uh, quite often it felt to me as if september was a more summery season you'd get what we used to do in indian summer though that late summer in the early autumn having had rain in august and as a keen amateur cricketer um uh, I'd, I'd noticed this particularly because you know you'd have Th three rained off matches in in august and then just as the season's coming to a close you get this glorious weather so um i've been i would had a kind of interest in tracking uh, or noticing you know the, the 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 way the seasons pass and i think certainly when i got back into birding after uh, some years off um that was 
that was sharpened that brought it into sharper focus as well thinking okay so this is migration season and this is other etc storm seasons or whatever um and then online i came across this um this concept the idea of the 72 micro seasons a few years ago and uh there was a website that had them listed and really i think what it's most firmly based on the, the most definite aspect of it is that the many centuries ago uh, in china and korea and japan uh the the calendar was firmly based on the 24 solar terms so it's on the lunisolar calendar of equinoxes and solstices um and there have been very there are loads of different variations of this according to country over the centuries but at some point somebody thought okay well let's just divide those 24 down into even smaller chunks now the, the actual history of the the micro seasons is a little bit murky um, and I was, funny enough, I was called out on this a, a bit um, on Twitter today, which was interesting. But um, but really what it was, it was just that I liked this concept of having these small packages of five or six days um, and each one having its own name that had been given to it over, uh, over many years. Uh, so that each little package is associated with a certain event, like East Flying North or... Uh, you know, the first one in the year, which starts tomorrow, is east wind melts the ice. So some of them are based on weather, some of them are based on agriculture, some of them are based on the you know the cycles of uh, animals, birds and insects, and so on. You know, bears start hibernating, that kind of thing. Uh, and it just occurred to me that it would be a nice thing to do to to spend a year uh, observing my local patch. Uh, according to those seasons so each chapter of the book is about one of those seasons and uh, just taking it as a springboard really for a, a, a nature diary with a slight slight difference but in the natal areas of japan and china and korea as you say there must be a change now. do i wonder if people still traditionally view that in traditional terms or are they thinking now actually with climate change you know, the, the ice melts, actually, what ice? There's no ice that yeah. melts. No, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure that, I mean, I think, as, as you say, I think things with climate change have changed a, a lot, even in the last 20 years, and will you know, presumably um, continue to change. Um, uh, so I think these, you know, this is something that is rooted in in uh, past times. And and obviously, even then, I don't think the, the the idea is that these things happened exactly on the same day every year. But they're just a kind of a marker that oh, so this is you know the wheat grass has started to sprout. So this is the time that time of year. Um, and I suppose it springs um, from two things. Firstly, the that agriculture was more a part of people's everyday lives back in the day. Um, but then. Uh, Japan, as he went through the centuries, um, Japanese uh, court life and the, the the nobility would be interested in nature as a more rarefied thing. And so you get things like you know, the poetry, um, especially in haiku. You know, you have this sort of um, uh, specific, specific way of writing and observing, writing about and observing nature which didn't necessarily have much to do with what was actually happening, but it was a more poetic kind of way of uh, doing it. So I was kind of intrigued by, by those ideas that, you know, that, that we've lost touch with um, the land and the cycles of nature. Um, and so really I just went into it with a, a, a way of thinking, you know, how much of this does apply? And can you do 72 whole seasons, each one with its own different character? Do they blend into each other? You know, so that you get. I mean, one of the things that happened was that, that for about four seasons and you know, about three weeks in a row, we had very similar grey weather, and I did slightly struggle to go, okay, what's the difference between it, between these? But then I looked closer and found that oh, this flower that wasn't in bloom last week has just suddenly gone whoosh like that. So there's something, a little pointer, just to go, okay, so this was the 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 season where the peonies bloomed or whatever it might be. So, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, um, they are generally quite vague, I think. Um, so putting them into little compartments is a, 
is a slightly artificial exercise, but it was it really made me look more closely at the, the things around me. You say that you based the book, the 72 seasons around your your home area in southwest London. Do you think that the seasons, the, the micro seasons may have been a bit more noticeable had you been on Orkney or in the middle of Dartmoor or someplace? Or do you think that being in an urban area, you can still perceive those changes? You, yes, you, I think you, you're right. There would have been certainly different things in, in Orkney. One of the ideas when I was planning the book had been, and I discarded this quite quickly, had been to try and find um, various um, natural events uh, that happened around the UK and maybe go out in search of those. So whether it might be, I don't know, arrival of um, Buick swans, for example, uh, or, or the, you know, that kind of arrival of swifts or you know, migration seasons, or in particularly interesting displays of uh, flora that might go, you know, suddenly into bloom somewhere in particular. Um, but then I, I realized that actually what it was, would be more effective would be to, um, because it's all about small changes, to focus it on a very small part of the world and what more natural than for it to be my own part of the world, you know, so I didn't have to go driving off all over the place. And of course, as it turned out, I mean, this was planned, the book was, the, the idea came sort of um, 2019. And uh, I found myself writing it starting the year February 2020. And within seven weeks, <laughs> we were all locked down anyway. So um, if I'd been trying to drive around the UK, that would have been pretty, <laughs> pretty scuppered. <laughs> so that would, and that was another interesting aspect of it, that it was, it's not a, by any means designed to be a pandemic book with capital letters, but it had, did turn out to be a book set in the, at the beginning of a pandemic. Um, and that brought that into greater focus as well. But to, to actually answer your question that you asked, um, which was uh, if it had been, if I'd been in Dartmoor somewhere, yes, it would have been completely different. And I think there would have been quite a few, you know, there's probably more going on um, in, on, on Orkney. There's a lot more to observe and different things. But uh, as I say, setting it in an urban um, environment meant that I, I kind of had to think harder and look for things a little bit more or find those little green spaces around me and even look at the those bits of waste ground that you get in urban areas and see what's growing there you know the bit of dead plot over the road that um people just walk past as quickly as possible i dive in there and go okay so what flower is this i don't know this flower of uh, these plants what's growing here do you think that people are aware of these seasons. I'm talking about the traditional four seasons now. Are, are people aware? I know it may sound a bit weird, but do you think that they're kind of so, people just don't notice nature at all, that we've lost so much touch, we're not in touch with nature anymore, that we kind of don't realise the season's changing until we're actually in the middle of it. Do you think that's the case or i think there's a strong case i think it's easy for us as great nature enthusiasts to assume that you know everybody else is equally tuned in but i think that's far from the case what i think people do notice is the weather so they will complain that it's you know the rate that it's raining or they'll complain that it's gray so they'll notice and especially the british famously or stereotypically are great weather moaners uh so it gives it's a point conversation isn't it you can say oh you know um nice weather for ducks or whatever it is um but as to uh nature in general i think as a population i think we probably are a bit rubbish at it to be honest and i'd love to um think that we are that we're going to get better um because it's obviously you know you and i know it's very important um but uh what was interesting and this ties into the pandemic thing was that about I said, you know, around that time April because it was a fantastic spring wasn't it um I don't know if it was where in Spain but certainly in in London and a lot of um uh, England the weather around the beginning of the pandemic was just amazing it had, had those clear bright sunny days um and people really noticed it and I started getting these messages from friends of mine who uh know 
know that I'm a writer and know that I'm interested in nature and especially in birds and bird song. And but they're not particularly interested in themsel themselves. But they kept on, they would send me messages saying, Have you heard, have you noticed the birds song really loud this year? Um, and I realized that actually they were saying that because they might have been noticing it for the first time because they weren't in their offices, they were sitting at home with not much to do um, and going on their daily walks and uh, and actually noticing things possibly for the first time in a similar way to the way I had when I'd come back to birding in my late 40s. You know, I was thinking, oh God, this has been there all the time. And now I'm only now am I noticing it. So uh, I suppose it's just that the other thing is that the, that at that time there was less traffic so the bird song will have seemed louder i don't know whether you've have you been in touch with any of the research on that whether it actually was louder or not or, or uh, I, I know there are a couple of papers that have been written about it but i haven't yeah. delved too deeply well actually i think um i think you said it really i think people noticed the sounds of nature around them for the first time because they're not <laughs> there day on day listening and also the fact that there was less uh, ambient noise, you know, there was no trains and very little traffic and all that sort of stuff. Mm. Uh, the birds themselves were hearing their competitors for the first time sometimes. Yeah. Um, I remember being in Spain um, and I opened the window and there must have been, it's about five in the morning, it was just getting light. There must have been about 10 or 12 blackbirds, all on rooftop mm. near me all of them belting it. I felt like I was in some weird jungle. It's just incredible because it's all echoing <laughs> the buildings. Yeah. It's absolutely incredible. Um, so yeah, I think that there has been um, people, you know, people have actually been more aware. And speaking of seasons, actually, um, for example, I was in lockdown, what have you, in Spain, and I spent an entire year in the end after thinking I'd be here for 20, you know, for two weeks. I was actually here for an entire year. So I saw the whole of the seasons go by um, in this region of Spain. And it was quite interesting because, you know, there is a distinct winter, even though extra Medina in Southwest Spain during the summer is up to 44 degrees heat. In the winter, there is a chill. And mm. traditionally, it rains a little bit from November through until April, even into May the following year. Cool. And before the, or actually when the rains first come, there's a, another spring because mm. during the summer, the, the ground is parched, it's blonde a lot, in a lot of areas. And then there's this regrowth and there's flowers and there's meadows in, in, in September, October, it's like incredible. And then, you know, the real spring comes again, you know, later on. But it's interesting how we, we look at seasons because, you know, I used to spend a lot of time to in and fro from, you know, to Los Angeles. And people living there who come from England will say, I hate it here. And I'm thinking, why? I mean, it's the sun's out every bloody day. What's the problem? That's oh, why. There's no seasons, you know. Yeah. And in, in the winter, you turn up in Los Angeles and there's people wearing scarves and, you know, and woolly hats. And it's like, you know, it's 60 degrees, 70 degrees. I'm thinking, <laughs> are you just doing it because you feel you have to because that's what you should do this time of year? And I realized today, yeah. funny enough, um, Lev, I realized today I went to, for a walk to the post office, mm. it's, it's, fair, it's January, and I wore the clothes I thought would be appropriate. I wore, you know, a, a fleece, I wore a, a puffer jacket. It was 20 degrees. And you're ripping them off as you go, with all those layers. Oh, I've been, I've been getting clothing wrong all my life, 56 years of it now. And it's, and it's sorry, even today I went out, and my wife had been out earlier. And we've had some slightly chilly days, you know, but because it's been a bit kind of grey, you don't, if you're indoors, you can't quite tell what it's like. So I just said, is it, is it hat weather today or not? I said, no, not hat weather, but just, you know, two layers or whatever it is. Um, uh, so, yeah, it's that, that's a very interesting um, aspect of it is that we do have, we probably have more seasons in one day than they have in LA in a whole year, I should imagine. You know, there are those days when you just have, it starts nice and bright and you go, okay, this is great. And by midday, the rain has, has has rolled in and it's just being you're being pelted by it and then by the afternoon it's warmed up again and and you know you, you get these you never know which way to look and the forecasts i think um uh they it's, it's extraordinarily difficult art with the forecasting and i think they 
tend to do it amazingly well. We take it for granted, I think, that they're going to get it right. And when they get it wrong, I mean, we've had all had that experience, I think, of looking at the weather forecast, seeing what it says it's doing in your area now, and it says it's raining now, and you look out the window and it's sunny, and you go, well, hold on, <laughs> how's that? But it's all based on probabilities, isn't it? So, you know, when they say 77% chance of rain, it's just, you know, in 77% of scenarios, it would rain. doesn't mean it's going to. Um, it's just there's a higher chance of it. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, so those that aspect of it was uh, certainly... Uh, interesting a bit of a challenge sometimes as well when you get um when i had a, a season that was you know five days with five different weathers um how to do you know how to, to to cover that in a in a chapter as well as the the stuff that was happening in the natural world and i think um as i say we do the, the reason that we are uh, as a nation kind of obsessed with the weather is that we've got so I mean, much of it um compared to LA where you just know it's as you say it's just it's going to be warm it's going to be sunny and it's it's not going to change much for months on months on end so I gather let's go back in history I mean the four season concept how long do you know how long that's been sort of in 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 the uh in the human psyche I think for forever hasn't it I don't know I don't, only went so, so so far back but it seems to be established in most cultures as far as I could tell um but uh, and including in the Japanese culture by the way you know it's, I'm not saying that that the 72 is the only way they have it um it, the idea is that you've got the four big seasons and then you've got the subdivisions then you've got these further subdivisions um I'm gonna have to consult the introduction because I just want to get, get anything wrong but I know of um other uh things I write about uh, where you get three seasons, which is sort of wet, dry, um, but wet to dry. And so in West Africa, you've got the wet, dry and the Haramata, which is named after the, the trade winds typical of that region. Um, and the ancient Egyptians, uh, if you go back, they had uh, three, they had inundation, emergence and harvest. So again, those ones which might be um, related to you know, more ancient cultures, absolutely uh, tied into the the agriculture because they depended on these seasons for their agriculture um and i, I like the thing where kurt Vonnegut, who's the, the great american writer he reckoned because he's from the eastern seaboard of america he reckoned that they would have that they had six so you'd have um the usual four but in november and december you'd have one that he called locking which would be the cold being locked in for the next few months. And then in March or April, you would have the unlocking. So, you, you know, so that's to kind of, it, you might get hints of winter before the locking, but until the locking hit, then that, you know, that, that wasn't fully winter. And then you're in winter. And then again, you might have hints of spring. Um, but it just, it, it does occur to me, because we all know that, you know, the, we're now looking forward to the first signs of spring, aren't we? Um, even in early February, and you might be beginning to get them. But the dif the difference between what we describe as early spring and late spring. So early spring, you might say, is kind of March, early mid March, and then late spring is in May, probably. And there's a world of difference between those two things in you know uk you've got just completely um different things going on and yet they're all under that one big umbrella of uh, the, the one word spring so um uh but it does seem to be quite quite universal for uh, the temperate regions that to have four when you get into more tropical zones then then it's it's more variable because of course they have those sort of monsoon seasons and, and so on with these what we would regard as really extreme weathers did you find in writing this book, there was a certain part of the cycle of 72 seasons that you can actually distinctly see things happening? I mean, it was kind of racing through. I mean, I'd imagine spring would be the time, but I mean, was there a, a time when things were really noticeable? Yeah, I think the, that beginning of the, when spring really takes hold, I think is the one that you think of, isn't it? When you just suddenly feels like suddenly 
everything is singing and everything is flowering and the war the, and the the air is just consistently three degrees warmer than it was and of course that's that will that um sets off a lot of activity doesn't it the actual the the consistent warmth um that comes from you know the our the, the tilt of the earth just going through its cycle and just getting uh, more sunshine or more sunshine and that triggers all the activity in you know, insects for example that that will be out and about at certain temperatures at temperatures only in bees and, and so on so i think that is the one that we'll we'd all think of which is just this fantastic whoosh and obviously as birders we think of uh, migration seasons as being, you know, something new, especially October, something new every day, some new migrants coming in every day. And those those uh, those two weeks, I suppose, would you say it's two weeks? I don't know, it probably changes year to year, but it feels like there's, you know, two or so weeks where it, you're just getting this fantastic activity of the, the uh, you'll get the, uh, the, the migrants dropping in. You also get the arrival of the Scandinavian um, migrants, and you get the leaving of the summer ones. It just feels like it's all changed for for a, that shortish period. Yeah, it's interesting because as birders, I mean, some more than others, I suppose. But you kind of, for me, I think of um, spring. Well, actually, it depends where you are. But in the UK, for example, I think of spring as you say, kind of March. Um, and spring ends for me in kind of early June. Mm. And then there's a period of time when there's kind of nothing. And then yeah. July actually is when autumn starts. Yeah, that's really interesting. Because I did, I, I did this on Twitter around the time I was kind of looking into it. And I just said, um, tell me when spring starts. And everybody was saying, "Oh, you know, Letter Selendine and First Chief Traff and all this, all these things that would go you know, um, uh, March." And then I did a few days later. I did okay. So when does autumn start? And people were saying, "Oh, all these stuff, things that happen in September." Um, and two birders, uh, when for autumn, said, "Green sandpipers, late June." <laughs> you know, this is that's that's when it starts. In fact, I did put that into the book, which is the end of one chapter. It's like, uh, it's uh, here we go, end of June. It's autumn time. What autumn? Because most people would think of June absolutely as as, as summer, but the the keen birder will be looking for those first movements uh, even as early as that, but certainly into July. Um, uh, so it's interesting how how different people um, perceive them, perceive these things, and I think for most people who aren't necessarily tuned into nature that even they will notice that they'll think of autumn as leaves falling won't they because it affects their lives it affects, you know your trains cancelled because the leaves are on the line you get the slush you you you're walking down the down the street and there's a pile of leaves that you can shuffle your way through um or you can find conkers so again that's much later in the year but that's uh um yeah, and of course, uh, in the old days, uh, when we were growing up, winter would have been icy and it would have been uh, snowy, uh, even you know, I grew up in Oxfordshire, so in, a, in a, a, a valley. But even there, we had some, some, some quite, quite significant snowfalls in winter, which not anymore really. Snow is quite a, quite a major thing nowadays, isn't it? Yeah, it totally is. Um... I was quite surprised when I found out that winter officially was the 21st of December. <laughs> I thought, what? I thought winter started before then. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing is that you get to, when you ask questions like that, you get people saying, well, it's 21st of December or 1st of December and not a day before because they're doing it according to the, the, the astrological, uh, astronomical season. Um, so yeah, you, you do get that kind of, uh, pedantry, which is the, the the other thing that is uh, that people will say is it's completely to do with when they turn the heating on, or to, or turn it off, and you'll find people saying, okay, we you know we do not turn the heating on until November, never. So I guess, well, what happens if you have a really really cold day in October? You just sit there like Michelin Man in ten layers and four pairs of socks. So yeah, no, absolutely. But then if it's mild in November, do you have the heating on then because it's November? Yeah, because it's, you know, because it's winter. <laughs> it makes no sense. Uh, 
<laughs> so maybe the best measure of seasons is 72 because you know well, i think so. <laughs> and in the 72 seasons which i've i've looked at, you know through the book and i've seen you sort of pick up on certain things like for example um for the uh the the, the 42nd season um, which mm. is the 2nd of september to the 7th of september uh dragonflies lay eggs on water um so which <laughs> is <laughs> Of course, they are allowed to do it at other times of the year, but it just so happened that during those five days, I, the, the, it was a particularly warm time, and and uh, went up to our local uh, local sort of semi-formal garden that they have, and there's a pond there, and I saw this fantastic. Um, I think they were damselflies, flies actually, um, but they were doing that, and and the um, the female was dipping in, into the surface of the water. And I, I'm not big on dragonflies and damselflies. I'm, I'm better than I was because I had to write about it. <laughs> there was somebody there, you know, who was standing next to me. I was down on my, you know, on my stomach taking photographs of these uh, fantastic things. Um, and there was a woman standing next to me, and she said, "What? What's it doing? It's going flat, flat, flat into the. Not only that, that they're, they're attached. The two of them were attached to each other, which is a fantastic sight. Um, yeah, head to tail." And, and the female going tap, tap, tap into the water and she said, what are, she, what are they doing? And I was un uncertain. I said, I think, I think that she's laying eggs on the water. Um, and so then, of course, I had to go and look it up. And this is one of the joys of it. You know, one of my, one of my things is you don't have to know stuff uh, to, to, to do these things. Um, you just go out with your eyes and ears open and powers of observation. And if you see something, then you might be uh, something that's unfamiliar, unfamiliar that you haven't noticed. You might be uh, interested enough to go and look it up. So I got back and just confirmed that I'd given uh, the right information. So um, yeah, that was a that was a nice one. Uh, not least because there were just a series of really nice warm days. <laughs> yeah. Enjoyed being out of the house. And the other temptation when looking through this book is to think, oh, I wonder what's uh, what's happening on my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> When's your birthday, David? Can you give us uh, a? It's the twenty second of August, and that's when robins sing autumn song. And they do, don't they? I think. Or, yeah. Or they can do, yeah. And I think in, for, so. For me, that was um, that's the last day of the season, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and that was also. I'm looking at that chapter right now. That was because we have, um, as well as the robins, that you know are pretty much universal. We're blessed with. Uh, quite regular great spotted woodpeckers, which are, of course are quite a common bird uh, nowadays. But they always they feel quite exotic because of the, the 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 you see seeing them at the feeders and they they're a little bit bigger than the average uh, feeder bird. And ours tend to come in patches, so you'll have a patch of about a week or ten days when they're there a lot. And I'll hear the chipping from the top of the tree next door, and I'll see them coming onto the um the feeders or they'll be flying around doing their bouncing flight um and then they'll disappear for two or three weeks and then you'll see them again coming back so it's a it's a always interesting a nice thing to to look out for and uh, when they do suddenly turn up after a couple of weeks they go hey they're back it's great um but yes that autumn song which is uh which is a again august that's a lot of people would say that summer but um Oh, that's most definitely autumn for me. Definitely, definitely, isn't it? Start of autumn. Was there any surprises for you? I mean, during this seventy-two week, sorry, seventy-two season uh, look at the uh, uh, yeah, did you actually have any times when you thought, wow, that's uh, that's unusual? There were, funny enough, the, in the very first season, there was uh, something that's quite unusual. It wouldn't be unusual for you at all, but for for me, and even in London, they're not that unusual. But certainly uh, on my very local. Path, at nowhere near any water. Um, to see a cormorant flying over the high street was quite the thing. Um, and that was in the first season. And it wasn't even that I heard it make its call or anything like that. And I didn't, I had, I didn't consciously see it before I looked up. But something, you know, that instinct that you have sometimes, you know, something is up. So you just go look up 
and sure enough, there is uh, there was this cormorant flying over quite low, um, with that purposeful kind of just like that. Um, and uh, I don't know, you, you can probably talk about this, but that in that instinct you get because you haven't heard anything consciously or seen anything consciously, but somehow you sometimes you know exactly where to look. Have you experienced that? Uh, many times, to be honest, and yeah. I, I'd add to that, but especially during autumn, there's this a sense, uh, I don't know whether it's the smell or something, but there's some kind of difference in the air. Mm. You know, I sometimes leave the house and you just look up in the sky, you just think to yourself, I need to be somewhere to see something because I know that there's some stuff here, you know. That's interesting. You Several know, people don't explain it. Would talk yeah, talking about autumn as well, the, the, that first marker, they would say it's you can't put your finger on it, but it's it's the air is different and the smell of it is different. That you go out, which I think is possibly something in a city that I don't notice so much because of pollution. Um, but uh, except that sometimes you do get it really quite strongly, but only on certain days. But I'd certainly know if I, if I was living out in the countryside. I think that would be something you'd be really quite tuned into. And maybe also if you were living co in a coastal area, you'd be tuned into the, the direction of the, you know, the timing of the tides, but also the direction and strength and the, the kind of winds you get. Um, I know the you know, winds are really important uh, uh, to anybody living by the sea. And I think you, you tune into it, certainly even when I've been on a kind of two week holiday somewhere by the sea, then you, uh, you just you you notice that a little bit more than I think you do in the in the city, whereas there's so much um, so much other stuff going on, so much other noise of different kinds um, blocking these things out. So that is yeah, that's kind of kind of interesting way of looking at things. What do you want people to get from reading your book? Uh, I would what I'd like it is and. This is something that um, cropped up the other day. I think there's, um, it's just a question of being aware of stuff. I think it's quite important because I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not hugely knowledgeable about uh, a lot of this. I think I, I do okay on birds, because I've devoted a few years to it, but compared to somebody like you, you've been steeped in it all your life. So for you, it's absolutely second nature and I'm getting a lot better at it. But certainly when it comes to other aspects of it, there's just, you know, the more you learn, the more you realize how little you know in a way. And I think there's a danger, and I think we touched on this last time, which is that sort of feeling you get from certain sectors that that this is an elite club and you're not allowed to join it until you have a certain level of knowledge, which is something, a really horrible thing that I want to I kind of quietly try and break down that, that, that feeling is that, you know, you just, if you, you go out and you don't know what something's called, it doesn't matter. It doesn't diminish the experience of seeing that thing, that bird or whatever it is. So I suppose to get from it would be just a curiosity to go out and do something similar for yourself. Um, and I do, uh, what, one of the gratifying things for me has been that really quite a lot of people uh, have contacted me saying, oh, I'm reading along through the year. So they'll, you know, it's quite an unchallenging way of reading something, which is a thousand to 1500 words every five days. I think most people could manage that, you know, the, the chapters are no more than four or five pages long. So, um, so that they can just go okay so this was the snapshot of what i had and how that tallies with what they experience and encouraging them to go out and see if they're experiencing the same things or different things or half and half but whatever it is it, they can make it their own and they can in the same way that you know i took the the japanese season names um and i recorded them in the, in the book but i also thought of my own um you know, so uh, one I was particularly fond of is Christmas trees are released into the wild, which is season <laughs> because there is that time after you know, sort of early on in the new year when you're walking down the street and they're just all lined, <laughs> all lined up down the street, everybody right out, 
<laughs> and it's kind of sort of melancholy sight, these things that just go like that. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, giving giving the seasons your own names, depending on what you see in your garden or wherever you happen to be. I think that's really all I'd like uh, people to take away. It's just a curiosity to go out and do something similar. Well, I think you've done a brilliant job in demystifying nature and getting people involved because I think it's, as you say it's important to to break away those barriers and say you know as you say you can name things as you want um what I have noticed recently I mean obviously we are going through we're in the middle of a climate crisis and you know people are very sort of vociferous regarding that as, and rightly so uh, as well as carbon footprints but one thing I'm going to be a bit controversial. One thing I've noticed is that some people have taken it to the nth degree in terms of vilifying others for going somewhere or for even thinking about getting on a plane to go somewhere on holiday with family or something like that, uh, or, or, or not even so much holidays with family, but just going away to watch wildlife. And yeah. I worry about that because I think that that kind of dialogue, that narrative will put people off who could potentially be part of what I term as a conservation army. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you think about some of the effects of ecotourism around the world, if you are now feeling bad about visiting those places, and I've noticed it now, even now I've noticed that some of my friends and colleagues are not publicly talking about the fact they're off to wherever now because for fear of, of being- well, Somebody getting on them, yeah. Yeah, so what, what do you think about that? Well, it's a, I think it's a really tricky one. And as with pretty much every issue you care to name um, uh, these days, that it, that it has become almost um, you're right and wrong, yes and no, you know, this or that, with us, against us. Um, and the, it's such a cliche to say, I think you'll find it's a bit more complex than that. But I think it is a bit more complex than that. And I, and I think on, on the one hand, um yeah one of course one has to be aware of those, those effects and to do and to be um uh, as i say to, to, to be aware of it but once you start casting the stones at other people uh then you get yourself into a, a fairly tricky area i think i think all you can do and what i try and do and i fail most of the time is uh is to to do what you can do and try not to judge other people for what they do because they might have all sorts of reasons for doing those things um and as you say you might one of my um, bucket list places is costa rica um and there are a couple of reasons why i uh, haven't been to costa rica firstly i hate flying so uh, that's a, I've always kind of had a difficulty with aeroplanes, which is sort of bizarre. And I've got, I've got better at it, but I'm still, you know, not, it's not my preferred choice of travel. And secondly, I have become more aware, of course, of the, the climate impact. Um, but I still would love to go to Costa Rica because of the biodiversity and because also of to, to see how they do things there. Um, and I think if you just start saying, well, God, nobody must ever fly again, oh, it's, then, then you just get into a, you get locked into a single path of this is the right way to do it. And anybody who veers from that narrow path is automatically wrong. And if you take that uh, approach to multiple issues, you find yourself gradually uh, locking yourself into a very lonely corner where the only people who are acceptable are the people who agree with you on these 24 topics do you know what i mean uh and anybody who doesn't um uh, conform to that well immediately they're one of the bad guys um and you have to think also that you know that as you say ecotourism it's uh, it, it, it's useful to the people who uh, live in that area. You know, lo lots of places uh, thrive on tourism. Um, so it's an important part of the economy. So this incredibly complex and difficult balance of how to to go towards a, a, a more um, calm, neutral world while uh, maintaining economy. And I, I don't have the answers. And I think if you pretend you, if people who think 
think they have the answers, uh, who will also probably know a lot more about it than I do, with this rambling kind of answer. Um, but it, you have to be open to other people's points of view, I think, is what I'm trying to say. Um, but then I'm a terrible sort of fence sitter, uh, kind of centrist dad. So <laughs> probably people shaking their fists at me at the moment, going, oh, you're a terrible person. Well, I hope you don't sit on the fence on my next question, which is, uh, what was your favourite of the 72 seasons? I'm glad you gave me a heads up for this, because otherwise I would have been uh, kind of going through it going, oh, I don't know. But for me, and I do this, uh, again, if you follow me on Twitter, you know about this, I do a countdown to the arrival of the Swifts. We are very blessed. We've been blessed. Hope they come back. Uh, we have them nesting in the eaves of the houses along our road, so we we get, uh, you know, what nowadays counts as a decent number of uh, four or five pairs, and then they'll breed, and uh, you know, we'll have um, screaming parties in the late summer once the kids have joined them, joined them of thirty or forty birds, which is, you know, pretty decent these days. So for me, the the arrival of the first swifts um, at the beginning of May usually uh, for us is uh, a pretty much a uh, the most important day of the year in terms of the, the nature calendar. And I'll add as a secondary one, the arrival of the first Red Wings, uh, the, that kind of the um, the other side of it, which is usually in October and walking along on a reasonably um, cold evening and hearing that overhead is, uh, think, okay, now we're on to the next stage. This is, that's a little marker, the markings, and we're on to that now, that a bit. So yeah, Swifts arrive, which was season. I don't know, but I find it nineteen, season nineteen, in the second week. <laughs> and uh, where would you like to be in the world if you could be anywhere in the world in season nineteen? <laughs> it, it, I, I, really, I have to be at my home because the whole point of it is that they've come here. So um, it's going to be in my office, leaning out the window with a large glass of red wine, trying to get my phone to to film them as they scream past my office window at kind of, you know, first floor height. Um, so there are there are other places I'd love to visit at other times of the year, and Costa Rica is certainly one of them. Extremadura is another one, obviously. But You know, um, you know where to come if you do come. I do know exactly where to come. I'll be knocking on the door uh, before you know it. Um, but, yeah, so uh, it'll be at home and uh, trying, to, trying to find uh, different things on my doorstep all the time. Cool. Uh, Zoomers, just to let you know, we've got two more publicised um, in conservation groups coming up. The first of which is with a young lady from America called Rosemary Mosco. Um, and she's written a book called A Guide to Pigeon Watching. So that should be very interesting. She's uh, a great uh, urban thing. Sorry? A great urban thing, pigeon watching. Exactly. But she's a, a cartoonist and illustrator as well. So it should be quite an interesting evening. And that's on uh, the 10th of February, um, usual time, 7 p.m. GMT. And then on the 7th of February, actually, so this is before then, three days before, <laughs> um, we have um, Rodney Stotts. Um, Rodney Stotts is a guy who lives in America. He was a drug dealer. He's done time. He's seen people being killed and all that sort of stuff. and he got saved by birds and basically he's a falconer um and he's going to come along and talk about his life alongside um, a lady called kate pipkin so that's on february the 7th um and it's raptors and the healing power of raptors so that could be quite an interesting night as well there's more coming up so please keep an eye out for up and coming in conservation waves it's always a pleasure to have lev with us. Um, thank you very much for talking us through light rain sometimes fall, the British year through Japan's 72 seasons. What's next, by the way? Oh, what's next? I am at the moment, I am in the middle of writing uh, a book, uh, which is broadly about flight in the animal kingdom, all the things that fly insects, birds, bats, pterosaurs, um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a fascinating and huge subject, and I'm trying to condense all my thoughts um, about that. Fantastic. Well, listen, good luck with that. We'll have you back when that comes out. But in the meantime, thank you very much for being with us tonight, Lev. 
Thanks so much, David. And Zoomers, you know, it's always a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much for being here today as well. And uh, look after yourselves and keep looking up. <laughs>